Hi, folks. This is Marav Fine from JFN. I'm the Program Manager for Member Services here, and I'm speaking to you from New York. Um, just a word on JFN's mission. We're committed to leveraging the power and creativity of networks in the Jewish community to increase the impact of philanthropic dollars throughout our community and beyond. Each of our programs is connected to one of our JFN values. Um, we believe that we are really rooted in our values in the Jewish community, and we try to make our programming reflect that. Um, this conversation is definitely about partnership, or RA Voot, um, how we can work together to impact uh, the future of the community and certainly the leadership of our community. Today we have with us two fantastic professionals, Alina Gomolina, the Program Manager at Leading Edge. After 13 years working in the JCC world, she was working in the Russian-speaking Jewish community in South Brooklyn. Alina left to pursue her MBA and MA in Brandeis. Um, she graduated and joined Leading Edge immediately as the second full-time person uh, on the staff. She brings her skill set as a former teen director and most recently her director of community engagement and communication skills to Leading Edge. Her other work experience includes marketing consulting, youth teen initiatives, and working at the Combined Jewish uh, Philanthropies. Amy Bourne is a consultant. She'll also be speaking today. Um, she has over 12 years of professional experience in the field of organizational development, both as a consultant and as a, in roles internal to organizations. She currently serves as a consultant with two consulting firms, one focusing on corporate and government sectors, and the other focusing on leadership and public education all over the U.S. As a consultant for Leading Edge, Amy leads the Leading, to, Leading Places to Work initiative. Amy's previous work includes Director of Talent Acquisition and Development at City Years Headquarters, Leadership and Talent Consultant at Hay Group, and Fellow and Associate at Hillel's International Center. We have two really excellent um, ladies speaking with us today about their expertise and about how we can make Jewish organizations better places to work. So please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Mayra. Um, so just wanted to hear who's on the call today. Is it Alexander Moser? Uh, yes, that's me. Hi. Um, can you just give us a brief uh, kind of background on where you're coming from and why you decided uh, to join us today and what is your interest in the topic? Um, so I work for a Support Center, Partnership and Philanthropy. We provide capacity building workshops and webinars just like you guys are right now, as well as okay. consulting and change consulting for nonprofits in New York City. Fantastic. We do work with a lot of Jewish organizations as well. Amazing. Okay, great. So let's get started. Um, as Mirab said, I'm Alina. And working for Leading Edge um, is – one second. Great. Okay. So um, let's first speak about what Leading Edge is and how we came to this place and in doing this survey. Um, we began in March 2014 when the Bridge Span report titled Cultivating the Next Generation of Leaders for Jewish Nonprofits comes out and becomes our founding document. In this document, we have our initial work plan. You know, at the time we were going by the name of Jewish Leadership Pipelines Alliance, and that was a mouthful. Um, but, you know, through a rebranding process, we became Leading Edge. And this work plan was based on two main themes. Um, one that was identified in the Bridgestone Report was that the field of Jewish nonprofits is not sufficiently developing and advancing the leaders that it already has. And two, that many Jewish organizations do not have the value proposition to attract and retain the leaders that they need. So in order to attract, retain, and engage their modern workforce, we need to focus on company culture. So let's define what a great place to work is. Um, Bob Lovering, the co-founder of A Great Place to Work, which is uh, an organization that focuses solely on company culture, says that it is a place where you trust the people that you work for, 
You have pride in what you do, and there is joy in working with the people that are employed in the organization. Have you heard of somebody by the name of Jonah Peretti? Has anybody heard of Jonah Peretti? I'm going to take it as a no. Great. So let me tell you about Jonah Peretti. Uh, Jonah made his fortune capitalizing on what he calls the Board at Work Network. Jonah Peretti founded BuzzFeed. He basically looked at all of this data, um, and in a survey done by salary.com, it says that 64% of employees visit non-work-related websites every day at work. 64% of employees. That's an incredible, incredible statistic. And Jonah said that these are the people that are searching on the Internet for things to entertain them, for things to fill their time. And he, and he created BuzzFeed. But that survey also reveals that not only are they looking at websites like social media and BuzzFeed and shopping on Amazon, they're also looking for other jobs. They're sitting on LinkedIn. Um, and out of the employees that are sitting on non-work-related websites, about a third of them are actually looking at other jobs. And when asked in the survey, respondents said the number one reason for slacking at work was that they don't feel challenged enough in their job. Um, other reasons include that they you know, work too many hours or they're unsatisfied in their career, and honestly, they're just bored. Um, so if you look at the cost of having employees not be engaged, it's actually staggering to think because when Sage made this white paper on what is the return on employee investment, what is the ROI of having invested in individuals that are working for you in terms of uh, giving them opportunities to improve in their skill sets at their job, in terms of giving them opportunities to develop as individuals in their roles, companies found staggering, staggering statistics that it leads to not only high engagement, as you could see 38%, and a lower turnover rate, but your revenue increases because all of a sudden, all of that time that is spent not being productive is then reworked and then repurposed to create a more, um, a more, a better worker, right? And there, the high costs that are associated with replacing the staff individuals that are not engaged and are sitting on LinkedIn and looking for another job and are eventually leaving which leads to high turnover rates in organizations that are not engaging their staff, uh, the costs associated are staggering. There's statistics saying that about 16% of an hourly unsalaried employees um, um, and of the hourly salary, 16% of that salary would be the cost of replacing that person. And that ranges from that 16% for an unsalaried employee to 213% of a salary for a highly trained position. So there is a business case for why we should actually, you know, invest in our people. But as Peter Drucker, as the founder of Modern Management Practice once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It does not matter how expensive and time-consuming our strategic plans are, because if the culture at our organization is terrible, you can throw that strategy out the window. Organizational culture is the biggest driver of engagement and productivity at, in the workplace. So based on all this background, Leading Edge decided to look at the Jewish nonprofit sector and kind of take the temperature, right? Make, get a baseline of where we are, how we are doing, and how are our employees feeling, right? Do any of those things resonate, how are turnover rates, everything like that. So we partnered with Corn Ferry Hay Group, 
Um, and in February 2016, 55 organizations took the employee engagement survey. We had about we had 4,740 eligible employees. We had a 72% overall rate, and this is um, this is a snapshot from the survey. So let's talk about who these organizations are. Um, we by no by no means was our sample a perfect representative sample. What we did it was INSC an opt-in system. Um, we looked at our board of funders and said, you know, who are you funding? What kind of organizations are out there? We kind of want the the um, a mix a mix of different types of organizations, size wise, geography. Um, community, uh, we wanted representation from all the major movements, et cetera. So federations, JCCs, um, you spend student engagement, and um, we have the other category. Uh, it includes the Jewish Funders Network. So demographically, um, the gender breakdown was that it was 70% women, 30% men. Um, a notable fact is that when we're looking at the CEOs of these organizations, um, 15 of them had female CEOs and 40 had male CEOs. So it was the exact opposite that it was the CEO level was 70% men and 30% women. Um, for the religious affiliations, notable that about a quarter of our professionals employed in the organizations are not Jewish or not Jewishly identified. Um, we do skew younger in the sample, uh, and that is honestly because we have organizations like Hillel and BBYO, which are um, a very large amount of employees, which have a large amount of employees, and therefore they are overrepresented in our sample. So the good news is that our employees are motivated by mission. They're proud of their work. They have a commitment to their organizations. Um, many of them feel passionate about the work, the work that they do. So we're doing very, very well in terms of this factor. Now, this is completely on trend with where the, you know, the general industry is going. Right? The millennial generation that um, they're, they're estimated to be about 75% of, to become about 75% of the workforce by 2025, uh, which is a staggering statistic, they're looking and searching for purpose, right? Erin Hirsch, the author of Purpose Economy, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, has this theory that we are moving through these, um, these cycles of things that drive our, um, uh, the way we search for jobs. So we're coming out of this information economy where everybody wanted to expand their horizons, they wanted to pursue the knowledge. Um, when the Internet became the big thing, there was kind of a mass, you know, a, a mass horde running towards it, trying to figure out how to use it and um, maximize its potential. And now the millennial generation is taking us into this purpose economy where we are looking and searching for meaning in our work, right? We want to feel like we are part of something greater than ourselves, um, personal growth and experience in different, um, in different types of skills is what we're searching for, right? We don't want to just sit um, and, you know, follow a very, a very strict career ladder. We kind of want to move across this ladder. So we want to try our hands at possibly sales and possibly uh, marketing and possibly fundraising and possibly administration logistics. We want to move across all of these things. So the Jewish world, that is um, – our employees are seeking that kind of purpose, and they're very mission-driven, um, but they're, it's not all good news. So these are some of the opportunities um, that we have identified in the survey results. 
So our employees are stretched thin. Um, the interesting thing was is that although 62% of, um, 62 of respondents don't feel like they have enough people to do the work that needs to get done, um, this, statistic, this statistic is actually higher than those who answer that they don't feel that they are fairly compensated, um, which is interesting that people were more, um, were, were more readily, were more readily um, able to say that, you know, I don't have the resources, the people resources that I need to do um, what our organization needs to do versus those who are saying that, you know, I don't feel like I'm invested in financially. Um, so we kind of started asking ourselves where exactly is this problem generated, you know, um, kind of where can we insert our intervention? you know, is it with the managers um, and helping them support their staff and identifying those, um, those areas where you need to reallocate staff resources to make sure that people feel like they're not trying to move mountains with, you know, um, limited resources. Or is it at an organizational level um, where we try to help organizations think through of who you're hiring and how to find the right people to do the work, kind of putting the right people in the right places on the bus, as Jim Collins said. Or is it, you know, working with funders and talking about what this kind of concept that came out of um, the social, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review article very recently um, and kind of what the Ford Foundation is focusing on, and that's this concept of pay what it takes philanthropy, right? Um, letting funders know what is the actual cost of running a program, right? Because overhead rates uh, are not cookie cutter. Um, every organization has a uh, different overhead need because, you know, one organization has a lot of infrastructure, another one may not. So depending on that, you need to actually assess it on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's kind of the things that are coming out of um, this piece. The next thing is that we don't use management best practices, right? Um, there's a lot of individuals that are responding to the survey, they don't feel that they receive the training, that there is a continuous learning cycle in their skill sets. Um, they don't feel that they're being invested in as employees and therefore, um, you know, they may leave the organization. Uh, we're always going to come back to that. 52% uh, respondents did not have a meaningful performance review in the last year. You know, this is, this is the basics. These are the basics of good management practice and we're not doing it. Um, and 59% of respondents feel that poor performance is not being addressed effectively in the organization. But 88% feel respected and recognized in the workplaces. So this is actually something that caught the group's attention. Um, and they said, hey, <laughs> this, is, this is something very interesting because th these are statistics that we usually see and is very on trend in family businesses right, where it's very hard to tell your uncle that he's not doing a good job, but yet, you know, you can praise him. So in the Jewish faith, it's very hard to tell, you know, the uncle of your, you know, I don't know, your, the, the person that you went to camp with or um, the, the rabbi's wife that, you know, something's not working out. It's very hard because we're so invested. So are we a family business? Um, in some ways, in some ways we are. So uh, the next one is that they do not see career advancement opportunities. Um, there's 52% of the respondents that feel that they do not have opportunities for advancement in the sector, right? So meaning that they, do not see beyond their current role um, that they have a growth trajectory, that they 
they can move to another organization or if they even want to. 37% of respondents don't feel like they don't have opportunities for advancement in their organization, um, which is which is quite troublesome. Um, so we're not clear on career trajectories. There's three top reasons why employees consider leaving um, their organizations, and that's compensation. Um, so you know, not being paid what they feel they deserve. Um, career development opportunities that we just spoke about, and work-life balance. There is a very high burnout rate, and there is unfortunately um, this almost culture of over, like, working more hours because they feel like if you're not working more hours than you know, your nine to five, then they feel that their boss thinks that they're not working at all. Um, and this is you know, prevalent throughout different types of organization, organizations. But, you know, what is the difference between those employees that would, um, that would be leaving these organizations and versus the ones that are staying? And we actually did the gap analysis um, for what are the key drivers of retention. So those that are planning to leave the organization in the next year um, we're calling weavers, and they're in the green. Those or those people that are intending to stay uh, for more than five for five years or more in their organization, um, we're calling them stairs, and they're in the blue. So, five out of the seven areas have to do with confidence in leaders, um, like you know, clear, promising direction, etc. Um, you know, so basically the people who want to leave versus the people who want to stay are saying that we don't see a leader at the helm of the organization who is going to, you know, who's going to inspire me to be here, who's going to make me feel like what I do matters um, or that the mission of our organization is being fulfilled. You know, I myself worked at a JCC for 13 years you know, struggled with many of these things, you know, the pay, uh, the burnout, everything. But, you know, I was lucky I had some of the most incredible and inspiring leadership at the helm. And because of them is the reason why I actually stayed for as many years as I did. So it is, it is something that we really need to take note of. Uh, leadership matters. So an interesting thing that we did is we took um, the – the employee tenure, um, and we just supposed there was engagement metrics that were developed by Hate Group. Um, and what we saw is that we have quite a dip in engagement right after the 11th, 11th month mark. Um, and it continues until, you know, approximately five years down the road when people kind of, you know, get over the um, – I guess the bad parts of the management practice of the organization. And, you know, then if they get that next promotion, they kind of get into middle management, um, they're hopping a step away from the C-suite, they really then become much more engaged. Um, but the fact that we have this extremely steep uh, middle dip is actually very, very scary because this is, where we're losing people. These are the exit points in our talent pipeline. And when you compare it to the general industry, um, it is definitely not as steep as ours. So Corn Ferry um, Hay Group uh, has this uh, framework that they use to kind of assess how the employee, kind of what buckets the employees in each organization fall into. Um, and they do it on two metrics. We have enablement and engagement. Enablement means how enabled are your employees to do their jobs, right? Do they have the right resources and systems in place to do their jobs and to do their jobs well? Engagement, on the other hand, kind of takes a temperature of 
how willing are your employees to go above and beyond, you know, their job description for the organization? And based on these two metrics, Corn Ferry and Hagrid developed these four buckets, right? Most effective, detached, frustrated, and least effective. Um, and when we look at ourselves uh, as a field, and by leading edge, we mean the 55 organizations, kind of the, um, the sample of the nonprofit organizations in the Jewish sector, um, when we compare ourselves to, you know, the public sector um, and the non for profit norm that they have and the general industry norm, in the most effective bucket, we're doing better. 52% of our employees are engaged. It's interesting to note, though, that this is the bucket where the senior leadership falls um, more than anyone else. So that means the CEO, the CEO, the CEO. Um, and our least effective um, is less. So we're not doing that bad, right? But we do have things to work on. So now, how do we take our, you know, detached or frustrated least effective employees and move into the most effective space? So. Um, there's a couple of things that we can do, and that's one, improve management practice. Um, you know, ensure that we have, you know, an open feedback loop. Um, implement day interviews. Things that are not, you know, uh, not requiring a lot of resources or uh, a lot of infrastructure, but, you know, basic things, train our managers to, do things that are going to make the employees feel that they're being invested in or cared for or supported. Um, you know, streamline systems to increase enablement. Basically, get rid of the roadblocks. Strip off the layers of bureaucracy. There is no need for a person to go through, you know, three different people in the organization in order to order one stapler, um, which is a real issue sometimes. Um, there's this concept of the 70 20 10 leadership development, basically saying that um, an employee um, in their tenure should spend about 70% um, of their time on, on the job learning and you know, work through each project. Like they need to have stretch assignments. This is, this is the work that they do, and they need to be given things that are not necessarily in their real health, but will make them kind of um, adapt and uh, figure out ways to kind of reach for the stars. 20% should be spent uh, with a coach or a mentor, um, you know, working things out, figuring out how to complete those stretch assignments. And 10% um, in the classroom training, right? So there's a real... Um, there's a real need to kind of provide the employee with a kind of development opportunities, the learning opportunities, you know, continuous improvement. Um, and the last one is kind of connect this career advancement opportunity um, kind of across different organizations, right? Break down the silos. Um, there's no need for somebody to be a federation person for life, right? There are other organizations that can also benefit from the federation model of fundraising. Um, or there's a need for somebody to think that they can just be a JCC professional. So they can also go into a social justice organization because they're passionate about it um, and increase the flow of information about the different types of opportunities between these kind of organizations. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this thought and ask for questions. So I'm curious, I know we don't have um, tons of participants on the call, but how does this all resonate with you? Or, or are there any surprises or is there more data that you're interested in caring about that would be helpful? Well, certainly if things come up, feel free to be in touch with us. We have tons of data and 
uh, Alina did a great job sharing the themes that, that came out of the survey. So thanks, Alina. It's always helpful to hear, hear us talk through it. So thanks. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, guys. Um, as we have um, as we have questions um, as they come up, feel free to email me, email um, Alina or Amy, and I can send around that information in the follow up. Um, again, this was recorded, so you guys will be able to access this information moving forward. Um, and I've seen this question before. You know, what if we invest in people and they leave? What if we don't and they stay? Um, I think it's it's so important. I'm so glad that Leading Edge is uh, leading the charge on this. Uh, so thank you guys for sharing all your learning with us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing uh, what you guys come up with. Moving Thank forward. you, Mara. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll talk soon. Take care. Great. Bye. Bye.